the controversy over the ascertainment of the election of President-elect Biden and the start of the transition focused the media spotlight on an agency most people didn't know much about. Now, though, just about everyone that pays attention to the news knows that Emily Murphy is the administrator of the General Services Administration. She joins me for a television exclusive conversation. Emily, thanks very much for coming on the program. You referenced some pretty rough treatment in your letter to President-elect Biden. Tell me what that experience was like for you. So, Francis, I was committed every day to doing the right thing. But it, it did get, um, I think I got about 2 million emails within 48 hours. There were some threats against my family, my niece, my nephew, my dogs. Um, it, 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 the ascertainment process, I really believe, needs to be reformed because GSA just doesn't have the expertise to be second guessing who, who wins elections. You referenced in media accounts your conversations with one of your predecessors, David Barham. He was the administrator at GSA mm -hmm. in the time of the Bush versus Gore election 2000. What did you learn from him, if anything, that applied to your situation, Emily? So David Barham and I share one thing in common, which is of the last 15 ascertainments, we are the only two who did not have a concession immediately follow the election. And in 2000, Bush v. Gore, when, uh, when David was, was the GSA administrator, the ascertainment came after the Supreme Court decision and after President Gore, uh, I'm sorry, after Vice President Gore uh, conceded. So my ascertainment was actually the first time we've ever had an ascertainment that preceded a concession by one of the candidates which really meant that I had a challenge of what evidence would I be pointing to as the basis for that decision. For me, it came down to watching you know, the election results, the certified election results that were coming in from states and looking at the initial outcomes of lawsuits. I didn't think it was GSA's job to be weighing the merits of, of whether a challenge was um, appropriate or you know, had merits, it, it was GSA's job to look at the facts as they were presented by the states. And I think David's advice to me was do the right thing and is if you do, you know, follow the law and if you do that, it, you'll be able to look yourself in the eye at the end of the day and I tried to hold fast to that advice. The day that you sent the, the uh, letter that you sent of ascertainment to uh, President-elect Biden, what was different that day? than the day before, Emily, that caused you to say, this is the time, the timing is correct? Um, so Michigan uh, it was, and then Pennsylvania, counties from Pennsylvania were coming in through certification. So we were watching that very closely and that was November 23rd. Um, I was you know, had multiple calls throughout the course of the day and we really felt that that was the appropriate time to be making the decision. You have said on a number of occasions that you didn't get any pressure from the White House or for any, from anybody in the administration to hold out. Was there any dialogue at all with the White House about this, or were you able to operate independently and make this decision independently, Emily? I made this decision independently. When I say there were calls, I mean that I was talking to my staff and making sure that I was getting the latest numbers. Uh, the decision really was made by me without any pressure from anyone at GSA or anyone in the White House, uh, they really did leave it up to me to do what was right. You uh, mentioned a few moments ago and you said in your letter to President-elect Biden that this process should be changed, that you don't believe that this is the right place for this maybe. Uh, uh, what reform would you like to see in this process? And whose job, if not the GSA administrator, do you think, do you have an opinion about where the right place is for this uh, function to live? So I think that there are three different options. And the first one is that we revised the Presidential Transition Act of 1963. And I know that David Barham, when he testified on ascertainment 20 years ago, suggested that Congress really needed to give clear guidance. Um, we do need clear guidance on what ascertainment means. Because the, you know, the definition is to determine with certainty. You can't really determine with certainty um, without having some concrete standard to point to. Another option would be to instead have an independent commission that with people who have expertise in election law um, and in election results and have them make that recommendation. And then the the third option, which is probably the, the easiest one 
to implement would be to allow that certain uh, support activities, because remember, ascertainment isn't who is going to be the president. Ascertainment is who has access to transition funds and to um, into the agencies to make that available to any viable candidate at that point in time until there is a concession or until there is more clarity. And that's, so I think that that would be the easiest option. Yeah, and that was what I was curious about, Emily, because that transition function lives inside GSA, it strikes me as useful that somebody, some high executive at GSA says it's okay for this campaign, this candidate, or that campaign, that candidate, to proceed with transition functions and receive the money that GSA holds to release to that candidate. Does that piece of it, at least, do you think, should that stay at GSA? I think GSA is really well positioned to do things like provide the space for the transition. Uh, we've been providing space to the um, to the president-elect since he became the, the candidate back in September. Uh, we've been providing them with IT support. We've been providing them with, uh, you know, we're now providing them with, with about $6.6 .6 million in funding, um, access to a SCIF, some more space, some more IT support, access to agencies. Those things, are very much within GSA's ability to provide. There are back office functions that we provide to a lot of agencies throughout the government. I think it's that that the determining the uh, you know th that actual ascertainment piece without greater guidance that's really the challenge. Emily, a number of longtime GSA employees have told me over the last several weeks they think that uh, your agency's work has been obscured by this ascertainment situation. We'll look at more on what the General Services Administration does and what uh, you have done during your time there. When Government Matters continues, we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. The ascertainment of presidential elections is one very, very small aspect of the job the General Services Administration's administrator does. The current holder of that job says her agency saved taxpayers $21 billion during her tenure there. Emily Murphy's administrator of GSA. Our television exclusive conversation continues. Emily, thanks uh, for this. How did you arrive at that number of $21 billion? Well, first of all, it's 21.3 billion okay. because every dollar counts. Uh, so we we actually looked across each of our portfolios, and that within the Federal Acquisition Service, it was about 17.7 billion, with the remainder uh, um, coming from the Public Building Service. And the largest savings actually came in the travel, transportation, logistics area, where we got nearly nine billion dollars in savings. But then IT. Our IT category was a close second with four and a half billion in savings. We and it, we got the savings by just increasing the volume in sales. So the sales on using GSA contract vehicles grew from 55 billion to 75 billion in the three years that I've been administrator, um, as opposed to 15 billion dollars in the in the prior decade and growth. So we really it, this really was just an enormous amount of growth. But we also brought to bear new contracts like Smart Pay 3, got more rebates to our customers when they use their, their credit cards or the EIS contracts. I know Eric Hargan came on the show with me a few months ago and talked about how EIS is saving uh, HHS $700 million. So it was you know going through contract by contract and trying to find savings, whether it be in fleet, whether it be um, through IT contracting. And we, our share of IT contracting went up enormously as well from about 21% of IT dollars to almost 29% of IT dollars in the past three years. Pull back from the individual line items that you just described, Emily. What do you think the major difference is as to how GSA operates today compared to the day you were sworn in? Oh, there are a few things that I think are major differences. First of all, we're, we're working remotely, which is the, uh, we're about 96% remote at this point in time. And so we've had to sort of pivot. But if you look across GSA, where we currently have the highest customer satisfaction scores we've ever had, the highest employee satisfaction scores we've ever had, and the highest vendor satisfaction scores we've ever had. So we've been really listening to both our customers, our vendors, and our employees, 
pulling that together and trying to find ways that we can actually meet their needs. It meant investing in our IT systems, which uh, I, I have to give my predecessors credit. They did a lot of great work in making sure that we have the IT necessary for telework in place. We're now investing in things like making GSA Advantage work better so that anyone who wants to buy, a, buy something from GSA, it's easier to find it. We went from having 24 different contracts uh, under our, our schedules program to having just one so that companies who want to sell the GSA don't have to go hunting around and, and, and submit the same paperwork multiple times. Our, but our customer agencies also don't have to go hunting around trying to find that solution. I th think I've used the analogy with you before that it, it sometimes feels like GSA is a giant jigsaw puzzle and everything you need is in the box and we give you the box and we say here, you know, you're taken care of. Um, what we've been trying to do is assemble more of, the, of those pieces for, for everyone first so that they don't have to do as much work to get that solution. How are you going to codify that? How have you gone about trying to integrate that concept into the operations of the agency so that when you hand this off to someone in the Biden administration, this stuff perpetuates, this stuff continues to move forward? So I think that with the, we're at 99% of our schedules, uh, schedule holders have accepted the modification for the new schedule. I think there are only 80 companies that actually haven't moved to the newest schedule at this point in time. So I think that that's done. Um, I think that the work that's happening in terms of um, 876, which is the increasing task order competition, that that's going to move forward because that's just good government. Uh, and, and that's actually one of the things that I think is best about GSA is we're not an agency where we do highly partisan work. We're an agency where we're really about making sure that we serve our customer agencies and we ultimately serve the American people. So we don't tend to do 180s in terms of policy changes. But I think that we, what I've tried to put in place is sort of a flywheel approach where by making our systems better and easier to use, we attract more vendors. Um, and so it's easier to sell and we attract more customers. And for every vendor we attract, we attract another customer. For every customer, we get more vendors. So we just keep adding in. That lets us deliver greater savings, which increases our value proposition, but also means that we then have more resources to invest in making our systems better, which will hopefully then attract more customers, which will attract more vendors. So it just becomes a, a cycle of trying to make things easier for everyone involved. Emily, less than a minute left. The Centers of Excellence now is codified in legislation. What does it mean that Congress says, we want you, we want GSA to continue to do this? I think it's a great, good housekeeping seal of approval. And the fact that it happened, what, three years after we created the first Center of Excellence is lightning fast for government. Um, I think the best endorsement, though, that we've gotten is that two of the 15 agencies that were, that have had centers of excellence are actually legislative branch agencies. So if Congress is actually willing to use these, that's great. Emily Murphy, thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Francis.